So welcome everyone to what is now and next with microfiber pollution. So here is the situation. Our clothes are breaking. They're breaking while we wash them, they're breaking while we dry them, and they're breaking while we wear them. The problem that has been referred to as microfiber pollution really should be thought of as microfiber pollution from fiber fragmentation, what happens when our clothes break. This is something that happens whatever our clothes are made of, whether they're naturally derived or synthetic, but the synthetic side is producing what comes under the heading of microplastic. And there's arguments that whatever the material that these fibers, once they make their way into our public waterways, are posing a danger to the marine food web. And we are not waiting around to see what kind of danger it poses to humans as well. We believe we know enough about microplastics in particular to take action. So here's the reality, is that everyone who wears and washes clothes is part of this problem. But everyone who wears and washes clothes can be part of the solutions. I say solutions, plural, because that's what this problem is going to need. Like most conservation problems, it is more complex than our ability to just have one perfect silver bullet of a solution. Rather, it's going to take a suite of solutions to get ahead of and around this problem. And that's what this panel is about. We have people who are just about to join us that represent solutions upstream of consumers at the consumer level and washing machines and dryers, and then downstream of, of consumers closing the loop and being able to give our textiles, whether they're broken or not, a better end of life than we have now. So I encourage you to check out the, the bios of all of our panelists just online. Uh, so I'm gonna, instead of having reading any bios, we're gonna introduce ourselves a little bit of a different way. What's interesting about this problem and different from other conservation problems that we've been dealing with at this conference and in sort of bigger picture, is that this problem as we know it is only around 10 years old. No kids have grown up with microfiber pollution in their consciousness. And so I think there's a lot to be learned from thinking about how people working on the solution or interested in the, solu in, in the problem and solutions, how they learned about it. I think that's instructive for us for this problem and future ones. So uh, we'll all introduce ourselves by talking about how we learned about the problem and our work related. So I'm gonna start and then invite our panelists in. We learned about the problem in 2013. It, there's a paper in 2011 that could be said is the sort of moment the problem broke. We read something that I think would be considered science journalism. So a science writer, I can't remember what publication, and it was about this sort of newly discovered problem. And when we heard about it, oh, this problem just screamed at us, didn't just whisper, it screamed at us. And we set about with three goals to see if we could accomplish. And they were to come up with a solution sooner than later to help start stopping the problem, to contribute to the, at the time, scant scientific knowledge about microfiber pollution in particular as a subset of microplastic and also the naturally derived side. And three, to raise awareness about the problem in order to inspire people in the myriad categories and industries in which we have no expertise to come up with their solutions, whatever they may be, including behavior change. And so our solution is the Cora Ball. This is an in washing and in drum device, the world's first microfiber catching laundry ball. This swishes around with your clothes. We used biomimicry to design it. It's designed with coral as our inspiration. You can learn more about that on coralball.com. As far as the contribute to scientific knowledge, we've been doing expeditions to answer the question, what does microfiber look like and where is it and what is the source of microfiber in the wild? And we've been doing that by doing water-based expeditions. We've sampled the whole Hudson River twice, once the air, the soil, and the whole water column. And as far as raising awareness, 
we've been doing that different ways. One, by connecting with people at events just like this, but also developing a curriculum for schools that uses microfiber and microplastic as the theme and giving people of all ages a chance to understand the problem. So that's me. I'm gonna now invite Sophie Mather to join us. Sophie's the co-founder and executive direct director of the Microfiber Consortium, someone with whom I have had the pleasure to work. All right, Sophie, tell us, how did you first hear about the problem and what is your work? How is your work related? Yeah, great. Thanks very much. And firstly, thanks for inviting me on the panel today. Really excited to be here. Um, so, yes, yeah, so perhaps I didn't go back as far back as Rachel. I'm very aware of the papers that came out in 2011, but it actually really started to hit me around about 2016. I was on a particularly long car journey. We just had the referendum in the UK. I had a little bit of extra time on my hands to think about some things that I felt really, really passionate about. And this, you know, being a textile geek, somebody that really understands what goes into making materials and the complexities of all the different processes, I kind of looked at Rachel's Cora Ball and I thought, well, this comes from somebody who's not from a textile background. You know, hats off to her. She's done a phenomenal job, but I think we can do something else. I think we can get back to the root cause. We can really understand how the textiles are put together and really, you know, start to see what is causing that fiber fragmentation and where we can make that change really at the root cause level because I, I really felt that this needed to be a portfolio approach. It wasn't just about solutions in the washing machine, but somebody from the textile industry taking responsibility, working down the supply chain, whether that's raw materials in the knitting process, weaving process, coloration, et cetera, there was a lot we could actually do. If you think about a material almost like making a cake, it has a recipe, has so many different elements of it. And if we understand which elements are causing the greater fi fiber fragmentation, then in theory, we can, we can you know, change it, we can make that change. So I was really, really pleased to see the Cora Ball coming out because until then, this was very much an invisible issue. You know, everybody was talking about plastic bottles floating in the ocean. Nobody really wanted to take it seriously because you couldn't see it. If you think about these tiny little pieces that are coming off, you can't see them by the naked eye. So why is somebody gonna want to engage in it? So it wasn't until the Cora Ball came out that people started to kind of pick their little bits out and say, look how much I've got. Oh yeah, I really do understand that there is an issue that the work that we were doing really started to get traction. And I think that was a real turning point for me. So I love working with Rachel for that reason. I think we have very complementary um, approaches to the topic. And I think this is such a complex topic. It does take this kind of portfolio of different approaches. And again, a, a, another reason why today's panel is so exciting because we all come from different backgrounds. So that's kind of how I got started. And that was way back in 2016. Feels like a lifetime since then. Um, and I suppose, you know, going back to the reasons why I got involved, the core of our work now is looking at the root cause. You know, we have, we've got a, um, well, I'll talk more later actually about the, the, the work that we're doing, but we really are looking deep down the supply chain, looking at where we can make that change. And we've got some really exciting work going on. So yeah, that, that's me. And I'm really excited to kind of talk some more later on. Thanks, that's Rachel. Awesome. That's awesome. And I want to say that it might sound insane that effectively what Sophie said is she was inspired to do her work because our solution wasn't good enough. And that may seem like an opportunity for me to be offended, but I am not offended at all. In fact, I am thrilled because that's one of the things that we set out to do. And I am just, yeah, it gives me a little bit of goosebumps to hear that when, when Sophie said. So um, that is awesome. Okay, next, I would like to introduce John Malloy coming in from New Zealand. It is a very uncivilized time of day or morning in New Zealand. I had the pleasure of meeting John with some really interesting meetings while I was out there at Fisher, Fisher and Peichel who make laundry appliances as well as other appliances. And John's the general manager of the laundry product line at Fisher and Peichel and even more exciting, the chair of their sustainability steering group. Hello, John, how did you, when and how did you learn about microfiber <laughs> pollution and what are you guys working on? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And uh, like Sophie, I am really grateful for the chance to participate today and to, to listen and no doubt have my perspective changed. And uh, I just want to uh, also acknowledge that uh, Jennifer 
from uh, Fisher and Paykel is also on the line listening, and uh, she's one of our resident rocket scientists in our laundry team. I say that with all affection, uh, and uh, she's my backup if uh, if I go a, a little astray today. But how, yeah, when did I personally hear about this problem? Look, I would have to say it was probably only three or three and a half years ago uh, as I got more involved in our laundry business at Fisher & Paykel. Uh, but I do know that the team has been aware of it for much longer than that. And um, you know, I guess, how did, how did we hear about it? How did, I, how did I hear about it? It really was on the back of uh, our team being very aware of the issue and a real desire to figure out where we sit in the problem. How was how how is our uh, business, how are our products involved in the problem? And uh, we've really been on a, a learning journey for for that amount of time. Uh, we've been looking at product design. We've been trying to understand what the definition of a microfiber is, uh, you know, aspect ratios, all of those kind of uh, things that are down in the science. Uh, the probably the uh, I, th I think our journey represents maybe what uh, others have experienced, where we've started we started down one track and we've we've actually diverted and pivoted a few times along the way. Uh, and it, as as recently as uh, two or three weeks ago, when a few papers came up that we hadn't seen before, and it made us really rethink and challenge ourselves whether we were actually looking at the problem correctly. Uh, and I'll just give a give one example of uh, how possibly our perspective has changed uh, quite quite a lot in the last uh, I'd say six to eight weeks, where we had been investing a lot of time in the washing machine itself and looking at some pretty complex ways to filter uh, and some complex ways to try and get around convenience for consumers and and all of those kind of things when it comes to filters. But then it's been dawning on us actually how important the drier side of it is as well. And uh, in fact, probably uh, in the last three or four weeks, we've gone, holy smokes, actually, the dryer probably is the, the big deal in this whole thing. And uh, and we may be fiddling in the weeds with the washer. You know, that, that could just be the icing on the cake. But actually, airborne stuff through dryers could be a really big part of the problem. Uh, what are what are we actually doing about it? As as everybody would expect, we are looking at the design of our products. How does that? Uh, how can we change that to impact on the problem? Uh, not only from a filtering point of view, but actually upstream in terms of how you wash uh, clothes and how you dry clothes. Is there other ways we can do that differently that reduces the shedding that Rachel talked about? Uh, but we, we're also trying to think about it a bit more broadly in terms of what's the business or what's the ecosystem around us. And um, I think we, we are privileged in a way that we have products that go into somebody's house and they stay there for anywhere from 15 to 20 years if we're doing our job well. So we, we become part of somebody's life for that, that amount of time. Uh, so that is an opportunity for us to participate in changing uh, changing mindsets, changing behaviours, and also being part of maybe a, a larger ecosystem of dealing with this problem. Uh, that's pretty big when we think about it on a global scale, uh, but it's it's one of the, the approaches we're taking. Um, yeah, so uh, Rachel, that's pro hopefully a pricey of how did we, or when did we hear about it and what are we trying to do about it? Great, I appreciate that. And I'm trying to drop a link to a paper that we did that is called dryers, electric dryers, an underestimated source of microfiber pollution that we published last year. It's open access. I'm having trouble with the chat, but I'll troubleshoot that. In the meantime, Shay, come on in. Shay and I have had the pleasure of being co-grantees in the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners Group, and the work that he and his team are doing is amazing. Shay, you give me hope. So how did you hear about microfiber pollution and what are you doing about it? Yeah, uh, thanks Thanks for having me. I first came across this problem in 2013. I was a freshman in college. Uh, I was studying biochemistry, not thinking about plastics or anything like that and was doing research in a lab and was kind of disgusted in the amount of plastic pollution in this world. Like we can build refineries, we can build these amazing mines, we can send people to the moon. Why are we using 
very archaic technology for recycling. And so that set off a journey to develop sort of an advanced version of recycling. Uh, the thesis that we have from day one and still is today is that recycling is sort of a broken system. And in order for this whole problem of waste to go away, uh, the right incentives have to be set up. I mean, if you think about oil, uh, we pay a lot for the products of oil, so people will go down into the earth to get it. Um, and so if the incentive structures are set up, aka the processes used to, to make high quality products are set up, then that would work. Um, and so uh, I, I come from a technical background, a uh, scientist, and so uh, textiles really stood out to me as a very interesting area to develop. If you think about textiles, they haven't really changed at all, in a sense. Uh, in the in the past, you know, a couple hundred years, and uh, microfibers is a very important part of that. I mean, everyone sees the pilling, they see the lint rolls. Like uh, that was a, that was an obvious problem, and so that's kind of the the, the key sort of issue uh, right now. Uh, trying to figure out how to incentivize uh, higher value applications from from this material. Uh, so we found out that you know every year around 160 billion garments. Uh, get thrown away. And so that's a, that's a large number and it's just growing with larger populations. And so uh, what are we to do about it? Uh, and so uh, so that's sort of what we're working on. We're a Los Angeles based company uh, developing sort of an advanced recycling process. Um, and yeah, if the right incentive structures are set up, if the right design elements are used in the design of garments, as, as we all know, this is a multivariable problem. Uh, so if all of those different pieces start to come together, uh, then, then this problem of microfibers can go away. I mean, there's a lot of hope that uh, everyone is now aware of the issue, so now things can happen, uh, and people are becoming more and more educated about it. So uh, that's that's very very cool uh, to know. And so, so yeah, it's very very exciting to be here. I love it. I love it. Okay, thank you all. So let's get into some discussion. So this we're, this is really about looking ahead. There are there as we know, there's not one solution right now, and there's there's none that's just ready to be implemented and solve the problem. So it's going to take a bunch, and they're all in various stages. So I'm curious for you, for each of you, what are your goals for the next one to three years related to your work on this problem? Like specifically, what do you hope to and expect? Because I, I have faith to accomplish in the next one to three years. And we'll just keep going. The, the order here is Sophie represents the upstream most solutions. Shay is the downstream and closing the loop and John and I are kind of in the middle. So Sophie, one to three years, goals one to three years. Yeah, very timely question, Rachel, because um, September the 21st, we're actually launching the Microfiber 2030 commitment and roadmap. So really openly invite any of you on the call today to kind of find out more about that. I think there's going to be something posted in the chat later. But that really is a place and space for people to come together to work collaboratively in an aligned manner against some very clear targets and milestones. So that's us for the next nine years. And within the next three years, um, we're going to be scaling the number of signatories that are you know, accountable for the work. Uh, putting together task teams to actually get the work done, uh, working towards some very public uh, targets um, and deliverables, um, you know, being very public with the dissemination of information. You know, we've been criticized many times in the past. We are privately funded by our members and we haven't been able to disseminate that. So a lot of that will be going on in the next three years, but most importantly, the development of tools and resources. So many of you out there can actually start to tap into that and get the really deep knowledge that we've got so far. And you can start to apply that to your product development and make changes and um, reduce your impact, really. So very exciting time in the next three years. That is awesome. And we have a link in the chat for that now. So that's so exciting. John, one to three years. What can the laundry one. industry do in that amount of time? One to three years. Goodness me. Well, <laughs> I think, Rachel, one of the things uh, really just to hit it between the eyes, we have we are very conscious of legislation uh, in different countries around the world that is looming. And uh, uh, there's a, a few countries and a few regions that are, he, are ahead of others, but we think that's just the beginning. Uh, so that is at the front of our minds. We've got some business uh, requirements and product requirements to make sure we're compliant. Uh, but actually what we really are trying to do is to get ahead of that. We don't want to be 
uh, just responding to legislation because that tends to lag really what uh, what the problem is. Uh, we have got some ambitious product goals over the next three years and uh, not only product but thinking very much about new ways to launder clothes, uh, things that are less mechanical uh, that not only are easier on the clothes but use less resource in the terms of energy and water and uh, and also detergents and those kinds of things because all of those things contribute to to how the clothes or how fabrics are uh, are impacted uh, so yes i would say in the next three years we hope uh, well we're certainly planning to be uh, changing our product lineup in some significant ways uh, yeah, it's probably as simple as that, Rachel. That's awesome. And, you know, if, thinking about this whole process is what Sophie and the Microfiber Consortium with the textile industry are aiming to do is to make our textiles more resilient through knowledge and understanding textiles. So that's the first step is make our clothes more resilient so there's less breaking. The next step is exactly what John said is, OK, so if our clothes are more resilient, the next step is let's make what we do to them more gentle so that there is less likelihood of creating microfiber. And laundering, we know both washers and dryers is an extremely significant source. So that is music to our ears. Of course, in terms of the Coraball, we're kind of ready at the next step to step in and acknowledge that, well, there's probably still gonna be some breakage and we want to be able to collect that. And this is also where inline filters would go. So this would be uh, washing machine filters, dryers that ideally aren't spewing out any emissions at all. Can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, so that would be the catching point. And we are continuing also to learn about the effectiveness of the core ball, both how we can make it better in terms of laundry settings. So being able to work with you is huge for us. All right, Shay, one to three years. So you've got the back end of all of this. Yeah, so we, we essentially are building, uh, they look like chemical plants, but uh, essentially plants that turn mixed fibers uh, and extract and recover one component of those mixtures, which is the polyester. So if you have a handful of microfibers, you would put it through our process and the process would recover and regenerate just the polyester component uh, that would go back into apparel, all right? So setting up that infrastructure not just in America, but worldwide, to create a higher value output for those materials that would normally go to landfill. And we think if there's those outputs, then that would incentivize the collection and the aggregation of this waste material. Uh, because at the end of the day, every garment produced, every material produced will go to landfill, either in one year, a hundred years, or a thousand years. So we need to set up sort of completely new infrastructure um, and then also going back into the loop design for that infinite regeneration uh, where the right design practices are being used because quite frankly, we can solve all these problems. They're not intractable. And so if everything's done in the right way, then uh, that should be a very good circle uh, to sort of enable the broader, this broader vision for circularity, uh, which, which is going to happen for sure in the next you know, couple, you know, 10, 20 years. Be still my beating heart. One of the most complicated issues with this problem is that if you, if you wrote down all the different materials that make up whatever it is you are wearing, everybody listening, if we wrote down the four of us, we could have 20 different materials between the clothes the four of us are wearing. And that is a huge challenge. So to be able to take a handful of God only knows what and be able to get the high value parts out is a, a very, very cutting edge technology because that just didn't exist when we all started working on this problem. So that's really exciting. Okay, so I have some questions for each of you. All right, Sophie. So as we know, prevention far upstream of consumers is a huge goal here. And a lot of the work you're done here is with brands. So I'm curious is what can brands who work with textiles expect to experience moving forward? And what do you want decision makers in textile and fashion industry uh, companies, what do you want them to do to either start being part of the solution now or to be ready to be part of the solutions that are in their world? 
Yeah, great question there. So yeah, we're already working with a number of brands and retailers and their supply chain partners, but I think with the commitment, we can actually get far more signatories involved. So if we can in invite those brands to come on board, um, we can, we've got the test method that's already available um, and out there. So they've got a method that they can start testing their material portfolios. We've already got a data portal where when they've tested their materials, they can upload it to our data portal. And we really need to scale that data. At the moment, we can get trends and indications of what's happening to make those business statements, to make real business change. We need scale of data. So let's get them involved in that. They then, once we've scaled that data and we can use that data portal to inform our decision making, we can share best practices with them through our knowledge hub which we are just about to start working on. So that is kind of a 24 seven access to information about different processes, whether that be the coloration or how a fabric is finished. They can then use that back into their um, product development cycles. So their designers, product developers can make that business change work with their supply chain partners as well. So a lot of engagement points for brands and retailers at the moment. And also they are gonna find more and more the consumer is asking them what they are doing about it. So they need to be able to give them some very tangible answers of how they're engaging. So a really, really exciting time for brands and retailers. So um, yeah, good, good timing there. That's awesome. And you're giving, giving brands and retailers an opportunity to front foot this and to mm. be ready for the inevitable consumer questions, which is awesome. And that brings us to John, you know, I was thinking about this and really right now, nearly all of the regulatory focus around this problem is in washing machines. That's kind of where it's sitting, but we're, I, I think it's easy to expect that to expand to dryers as well. And it's something that you did mention in your intro. And, you know, I think you're, you're going to bear the you being the appliance industry, the heaviest brunt of this particular regulatory. So what are you guys kind of thinking about around the fact that it is your industry in which the most regulatory kind of motion is happening? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So Rachel, I think we, well, f first of all, we believe we've got to participate. We have to have products that are being uh, responsible. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, where we had been focusing on the washing machine, we are very recently realizing how important actually the dryer probably is in this whole uh, whole thing. Um, if I step back a little bit, the, what our, our learning has taught us in the, the last six months is just actually how important it seems that shedding in the environment is. Uh, so when people are, uh, so if we if you, know, if you think about a hundred fibers that are shed, it it sounds like somewhere in the order of eighty percent, maybe higher, of those maybe eighty percent of those hundred fibers are shed when somebody's wearing their garment, and that actually a, a quite a small amount of that remaining twenty percent is shed through the washing machine water, a large part of that remaining bit of fiber is uh, probably shed through the drying process, either drying on the washing line or drying in a dryer uh, uh, through the laundering process. Uh, so yeah, we, we're mindful of where legislation seems to be going, but we're not confident that it's going in the right direction in terms of where to focus in the laundry. Uh, we're participating at the moment in a working group uh, that's up in the UK that's focusing on the legislation that is probably going to be starting to, to wind in from 2025 in the, in the UK. Uh, and actually Jennifer, who's on the line here, has been, I think, shaking things up a little bit, uh, talking about the science there, rather than uh, just on the emotion and uh, and some of the, the other things that come in. Um, so yeah, we, we are very conscious of, I mean, as a business, we've got to be really conscious of of legislation. We can't ignore it because uh, we're a small player in a very large uh, large world. Uh, but equally so, we are looking at how to actually, uh, where, where we should focus to have a genuine impact on the problem. Um, if I just give a give a, a couple of little sound bites where we think, you know, we we uh, uh, think about the drying process and that whether in in our dryers, in our relatively current dryers or the ones that we're going to be uh, launching over the next uh, six to, to twelve months, 
Uh, there's potential for doing some really simple things like having cycles in the products that are actually about the uh, um, you know defibering, defragmenting, because it sounds like and looks like a huge amount of uh, the you know if you if you're wearing a garment, uh, you you wash it and you start wearing it. There's probably this large number of fibres that are in that garment that are caught. They're already fragmented, but they're caught. They haven't been pulled through in the wash but they're in that garment. And then as that person walks around and does their daily life, those those broken fibers shed. Uh, so one of the ways to capture those could be that you take it out of the dryer, uh, sorry, take it out of the washing machine and you put it through the dryer, maybe not to dry it, but actually just to tumble it. Uh, the airflow in the dryer helps to pull those fibers out. They get caught in the normal, um, uh, the filtering system that a good dryer should have, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and then the person can wear that garment without all of those broken fibres ready to, to shed. We think that's one way to really reduce the amount of fibres that get released from people wearing their garments, uh, as well as from Sophie's work upstream with uh, fibres and, and clothing design that is more robust. Or when I say more robust, less likely to fragment. If we're then able to capture more of those which is possibly more through the dryer and less through the washer and then uh, you know passing the passing the ball downstream to shea picking those uh, those last remaining bits up through the recycling and so on um, but I, just the last thing rachel sorry to go on a little bit i want to talk about the dryer um the i just want to put a call out there for everybody if you get if you have the chance to buy a heat pump condensing dryer you should uh, they are um, eight plus times more efficient in terms of energy use than a standard vented or what they, yeah, we call it a vented dryer or a standard dryer. They're much, much more energy efficient, but they're also closed cycle. So they don't vent out into the atmosphere. They're a closed cycle. They should have two filters. And that is a great way to stop the you know the vast majority 99.9% .9 of uh, of fibers being vented out into the uh, the atmosphere they are a win -win. Just, quick, just to clarify is that the kind where the water is what gets emitted it, it gets <clears throat> emitted in the form of water so the heat gets there's nothing that comes <clears throat> out of the dryer nothing comes water, out no the water. water the water's captured the uh, the fibers are filtered out of it it's uh, it's a great great system and, and uh, those things are uh, yeah heat pump condensing dryer to someone asked in the chat heat pump condensing correct dryer. that's correct uh, i have yep. one more quick question where did you guys do your own testing like wh is was it published science that made you kind of shift to dryers or is it work that you guys are doing in-house uh great question uh so <clears throat> it's a little bit of both i think there's been uh, and maybe jennifer can throw something in the chat here if she's uh if she's listening there have been two papers <clears throat> pardon me, that have been uh, fundamental in us shifting our view of late. Um, but they have correlated to some of the, and when I say correlated, gently, because we don't do fully double blind, rigorous testing in, in, in science in-house. Uh, but they've, those papers have correlated to what we think we're seeing. And uh, actually, Rachel, I have to say, after your last visit to us and a phone call you had with us, we're yeah, you, know, you talked about your sampling down the Hudson and how, holy smokes, there was fibres everywhere, fibres in the natural, in the, in the wild, fibres in the middle of the city. And uh, so a whole lot of things have sort of been pointing to this, uh, but we're, we've gone, wow, actually, we think we've been looking in the wrong place. The washer like an atmospheric isn't... atmospheric deposition situation. Totally, totally, yep. Interesting. So well, very, anyway, watch, watch this space. Watch the space. Uh, yeah, okay. I could definitely get stuck in there for a little bit, but we're going to keep rolling. <laughs> Shay, like I said, you're my beacon of hope here for this kind of back end. If, if we have the ability to capture fibers, the bits that do break, uh, is there something we could do with them? We know that that's what you're working on. So here's the question. Uh, if we have something like laundry machines, of all types and the core ball and whatever else that are going to inline filters that are going to catch fibers uh, before they end up in landfill. 
I'm curious where you're getting your raw materials as you guys move forward. And is this something that will be kind of industrial or can consumers get in on this too? Yeah, it's a really good question. So right now we are getting a lot of material in the post-consumer garment form. So old garments, uh, we have some partners here in Los Angeles where we're sourcing material from. I think the big idea here is that this is a very fragmented industry. And unlike most process industries, the waste or the feedstock is everywhere because everyone wears clothing. So you can also imagine everyone produces a small amount of microfibers, but geographically it's all over the place. So sourcing that material to a central location is kind of a nonlinear task. There's a lot of details and costs that go into moving material from one place to another. Um, and then I will also mention that there is already a lot of existing infrastructure in moving things around. Uh, one example that we've learned a lot about in the past couple of years is the industrial laundry uh, companies who exist in all major metropolitan areas. Uh, some of them have the capability to source material to central locations and process them. And so we can work with companies like that uh, to actually source material. Uh, you can think of this as a way to leverage existing infrastructure for these future business models to come online. Um, the long term problem, though, is once you collect the material, what do you do with it? Um, and if you can do something that's very high value, if you can do something that's very good, if you can make a very good product, then that will trickle back into providing the margins that the operators within that collection chain need to make this process incentivized properly and work. Because uh, it has to work in a very frictionless way, uh, right? It should be very easy for, for you to have garments in your closet, for you to have uh, sort of packages of lint in your house and, and get them into a collection system. Uh, and that has to be very frictionless as well. Um, but again, I guess where we come at it is like, can we first create a very high quality product and start building that sort of pull uh, to, to, to provide the operators uh, with as much space as they need uh, to, to get material? So... Right now, the, the challenges are there's no infrastructure and it's very fragmented. Um, so we're really starting sort of small and, and, and working in Los Angeles and figuring out a model that works. Uh, we've tried uh, a couple ideas. We've tried, we've tried a, a, something like a food delivery service where someone comes and drops off a package to your house and picks up garbage or garbage, but old garments. Uh, we've had collection systems here in L.A. where uh, people come to our facility and drop off old garments. Uh, and, and that seems to work in some situations. Uh, and then we've also had people mail us stuff completely unsolicited, because I think this speaks to a larger phenomenon happening right now where people want change uh, and brands and industries will want change as a tangential uh, to people like you and I, like all of us here today, wanting to make the world a better place. And so that will trickle down as well. And I think it's really interesting to see how we get a lot of material actually just from people uh, mailing us stuff completely unsolicited. And that's, that's every day we get packages. Um, and so it, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, and I think those will evolve as these, as these systems are tried. And of course there will be failures, but the, 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 the vector towards success here is uh, models will be tried. There will be failures, but some models will start to work and that'll start to, to just auto catalyze and, and a solution will, will, will come about in a couple of years. That's how this works. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, two things really resonate with that is, you know, I've been working on the problem of marine debris for 11 years now and no single part of the problem like derelict fishing gear or consumer debris or derelict vessels resonates with people as much or uh, inspires as much immediate willingness to take action as our clothes falling apart and inadvertently spewing all over our environment. In particular, it seems the our, our public waterways and our one big precious ocean. And something else you said, which I think is key to all this, is this recognizing and getting value out of this material. And polyester is what you're working on. And, and you know, for everybody listening, we had a few little chats and e email chats before this, the four of us, and a question that came up from John's team was about synthetic fibers. And it, here's the question, it is, what is the trajectory of synthetic fibers 
Synthetic fiber use seems to be increasing rather than decreasing. So as opposed to something like single use plastics and what do we think is going to happen? So uh, I'm curious, Sophie, in the textile world, what are your thoughts on, on this issue of synthetic clothing kind of as a big picture? Okay, I was so pleased when John brought up this question because I think we're going to get some really lively debate here. Um, to me, synthetics aren't necessarily the bad guy. I think John made a really good point earlier on about, you know, uh, fibres being lost during wear, through air pollution, through tumble drying, etc. That's not necessarily synthetic fibres. What we're seeing is we're getting more fibres released that are natural or cellulosics through air release and perhaps more um, through water pathways for synthetics. So I think as we start to get more into the area that John was talking about, we're going to start to see that, uh, that natural fibres are actually the bad guy as well. So that's the first point. The second point I want to make, just kind of supporting the synthetics world, because we know that you know synthetics are over well over 60% of the market segment, um, and that will increase. We have It has to increase because of the demand for clothing. We cannot support that purely through natural fibres, wool, cotton, silk, et cetera. It has to be done through synthetics. But I do want to remind everybody, however painful it is, that when synthetics first came out, they were those scratchy, heavy sports shirts that, showing my age here, that we wore in the 70s and 80s. They were disgusting. Now we have got really fine synthetics that you can have, you know, a tent on the edge of a, a cliff, you know, that is really super high performance. You can have beautiful clothing that really keeps you warm, keeps you dry, etc. And that is in that period of time. If we take synthetics to the next level, they will not shed because we will be doing our job to prevent them from shedding. So I think if we see synthetic as an enabler of change, rather than always as the bad guy, then I think we, we look at this quite differently. So I think unless people are going to stop buying clothes, I don't think taking synthetics out is the solution. But I think we have to get more of people that are geeky and nerdy about textiles together to actually redesign how we're doing it to make synthetics beautiful. Because when we look at the sustainability impact of fibres in general, synthetics can offer some fantastic solutions. We can already dye polyester without any water, with reduced chemicals, with reduced you know, carbon impact, et cetera. Um, so why take that away purely for this one topic within the larger sustainability agenda? So sorry, very opinionated on that one, but it gets me it. really excited. So yeah, looking forward to hearing the other responses. This is the place for that. Shay, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's it, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of I, polyester is here to stay for sure. I mean, in the next in the next three years, uh, uh, the China is going to turn on 14 million tons of additional polyester production. Um, it's it's here to stay. Uh, you cannot clothe people with cellulose uh, long term. If you think about any movie that's a sci-fi movie, they're all wearing a synthetic material. I think it's totally the future because you are being able to now. Uh, start to do things that with with uh, polyester that are that are quite quite good. Um, yeah, I really I think I think cellulosix will become a luxury in, in 100 or 150 years. You know, there's so much of it. And uh, as you know, these things where we become multiplanetary and stuff emerge, like we, we can't be bound to uh, to these systems. So uh, just thinking about the future, what does the future look like? It, it would make sense for it to be a, a primarily synthetic future. Uh, and so Right now, I mean, that's what we see in our in our waste streams as well that we collect. It, it's a lot of polyester. And so that's kind of why we focus on polyester, because it is be, going to become uh, the material that will make up most of the uh, the post consumer textile materials of the future. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty obvious uh, what's happening. And uh, yeah, and uh, it's uh, yeah, polyester is for sure going to be uh, number one. Yeah. And, you know, for my part of this, I, you know, we talk about uh, I, I went to a conference, an MIT nano conference, and over and over again, people got up and effectively said, there's not enough resources just to feed the people on, on this one planet. And it's going to take three planets to feed people. So my deduction there is we can't feed and clothe the planet on our agriculture. And that means there is a place for synthetics. And then let's put it in the context of this conference. This conference is the intersection of water sports and climate change and protecting our planet and the venue of surfers and sailors and stand up paddlers. And I do all those things, not surfing so well, but more skiing and stand up paddling and wing foiling and all that. And 
mountain biking and I don't wear any real natural. I do have some wool going on, but the fact of the matter is, is that exquisitely effective technical clothing is made from synthetics and doing those synthetics better is something that we believe in as well. It is worth every effort to keep it in the mix, but do it better, better even than we're thinking of now, keep them from shedding, make sure they're recoverable on the back end. And so uh, it'll be interesting to hear just from people in your comments, in the Q and A section or the chat, if you agree with that, if that's unexpected or not. And we're kind of getting to the start of the last 15 minutes. So I do want to do one thing. This is for everyone, not just our panelists, everyone sitting in the reef room or sitting on your computers or on your phones or wherever you are, get your keyboards ready. So we have a little voting. We're going to do a little sort of speed round. This is thinking about solutions. This is interesting information for us. So get your chat tabs up. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some potential solutions, some uh, things that are in the mix. And we'll post them in the chat one by one. And let me just, I'm just sending them over. Um, OK, so the first one is I want everyone to vote on the first one is going to be labeling laws on garments. This is a solution that has been proposed to allow people to understand that your garment can shed, it might emit microplastic. Uh, there's not a lot of information entirely, but it was interestingly one of the first. So here's what we wanna know, thumbs up, thumbs down. So yes, no, maybe, or a question mark, meaning we just don't have enough information. The second one, oh, you got it already, coatings. Let's go third, making textiles out of bio benign, so that's extremely natural and biodegradable materials. So that's wearing things that came from the earth that could go back to the earth. All right, I don't know what order you went last time, but we'll go the Hollywood squares on my computer. John, what is thumbs up or down for making textiles out of bio benign and biodegradable yeah. materials? Thumbs up, Shay. Uh, I don't know, maybe, possibly. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Uh, Sophie, what do you think? Metza, metza. Not, not enough information yet. I agree. I'd be worried that it might, same argument, like let people kind of be responsible on the back end, but I am a fan of investigating materials. So I think we need more info. For me, that's a need more info. Telling people to stop wearing synthetic garments as a solution. So that's straight up. I've seen it before. Telling people to stop wearing synthetics. I think I know the answer. So John, that's a no, Shay. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that's a no for me. That's a no. Sophie, that's a no. That is a no for me as well. Audience, what do you think? So I see no's on telling people to stop wearing synthetics. It's just too much, too much pressure on the, uh, on the earth. Okay. Regulation on emissions from washing machines regulation on emissions from washing machines. All right, policy. For me, I think it's probably smart. I don't know that all of the laundry industry is as forward thinking as Fisher and Paykel. I appreciate Fisher and Paykel wanting to preempt that. So I'm gonna go with a yes, but we do need the data to make sure the regulations are appropriate. Sophie. Can I go one more than that? I think it needs to go beyond washing machines you know, I think in today's conversation, we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about air emissions. I think regulations in general, yes, specifically washing machines. I think, you know, we need to go beyond that. Yeah, copy that. John? Uh, yes, I agree. And uh, the, the usual thing with legislation, it's got to be done really carefully, not to create another problem somewhere else. Agreed. Shay, what do you think? Uh, no, uh, it sounds like a waste of time. Uh, by the time regulations get in place, things will already be changing. And this is, you know, Europe and America will be able to institute regulations, but Asia will not be able to anytime soon. So uh, it, seems like a, it seems like a tough sell. Fascinating, because this is a global problem. One big ocean connects us all. Pollution there is pollution here. Uh, so my next one was regulation on emissions from dryers. Do any of you have a different take on that? Or would you say same answer as last? Same answer. Yes, same answer. Same answer. 
All right, people in the world, same if you have anything to say about dryers is separate from washers, same. Okay, in drum devices and other aftermarket filters. Again, these are not the solution, but as part of the big picture, do you think people should still keep trying to develop these? Or would you say there's better ways to go? So this is in drum, you can't offend me. Uh, in drum, <laughs> in drum devices and aftermarket filters as part of the solution. Clearly, I'm a yes. Sophie. Yeah, I think there's a place and space for everything. I'm not totally anti the coral ball, and I do actually use it on my camping blanket. So there we go. <laughs> That's awesome, uh, John. So this is like in your appliances. <clears throat> Uh, look, I would say absolutely the in drum as well as in line. Uh, there are millions, if not billions, of people out there with old washing machines that will not. Uh, in fact, we don't want them to throw those those things away too soon. Uh, so you can't uh, solve the problem with washing machines that have filters built into them. Those in line as well as in drum things have got a, absolutely got a role to play in uh, in this. Copy that, Shay. Uh, yeah, because even if it doesn't work, it might increase awareness for a third party. Like if, if, if a kid is there seeing someone else doing this, like it might inspire some thoughts and investigation and education, which is uh, very important for awareness of the issue. Awesome. And that, in fact, was one of our goals to say, like, parent, why are you throwing a dog toy in the washing machine? That can spark a conversation. OK, uh, going after consumer behavior change. So that would be assuming that we have good data on laundering habits collectively and or wearing habits. So say that's an assumed. What do you guys think of consumer behavior change campaigns for microfiber pollution? Uh, I'm a yes. Sophie. Definitely yes. The consumer has a much bigger part to play in this. They need to be held responsible. Shay, what you got on this one? Uh, definitely yes. Uh, people are educated about the problem. They will make the right choice. John? 100%, yes. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. So challenge for all of you. I know there's a lot of people in this conference who are great communicators, educators, and working the line between kind of inspirers and, and educators. Uh, next one I have is EPR programs for makers of clothing and home textiles. EPR stands for Extended Producer Responsibility. What this does or means in the short version is taxing or, or placing burdens of some sort on the manufacturers of goods to recognize their those goods entire life cycle. This is something that's really a hot topic right now in single use plastics, but there are also EPR schemes for things like paint and having paint manufacturers be the ones who fund paint take back schemes. So the question for everybody in the audience is EPR, extended producer responsibility for the microfiber pollution from fiber, frag fiber fragmentation problem. John, what do you think EPR at the textile level? Yeah, uh, look, I would say a cautious yes, uh, knowing that there are often those ripple effects that go up and down from there. Uh, but it, I'm coming from a position of uh, that, you know, you think about environment, society, and then corporations in the middle. We, we uh, Companies are reliant on society, reliant on the environment. So there's got to be responsibility taken. It'd be great if the companies like ours took responsibility rather than we're told to, uh, to do it. Copy. Shay? Uh, no, I think that... Yeah, it, it change from change in an industry has never usually come from that industry. It's come from small DIY efforts that start to scale with, with people. And so, uh, yeah, and it, it hasn't really worked in other industries. So, uh, no. I'm a need more info because of the complexity of textiles. And it feels like it would be hard to zero in on something effective. But Sophie, you get the last word on this one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I spent far too long in the supply base and over the years I've seen the supplier squashed and squashed on price, um, mainly because the consumer's wanting things cheaper and cheaper. I love Patty's point about buying better clothing that lasts longer. 
If the suppliers are paid the real price for the materials that we're buying from them, yes, they've got some wiggle room to offer that support in EPR schemes and things like that. If you push them now to an EPR scheme, something else that's probably just as important from a sustainability angle will be compromised. So the suppliers will need to make a decision. So it's, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. So I think we have to go really cautiously into EPR. I'm speaking on the behalf of the suppliers. They do a phenomenal job. And over the years, their margin has been cut, cut and cut. And it's not the brands, it's the suppliers that are kind of pushed into a corner on this one. So just be really careful because otherwise you'll find it come back and bite you in the backside somewhere else. Yeah, it dries up. So really interesting on that one. And my last one is figuring out textile recycling and reverse supply chains uh, in terms of more effective a way to sort of manage one of the ways. Again, none of these are like the only thing. Uh, so, so I'm a big yes. Sophie, what do you think on this one? I'm not 100% cl uh, clear what you're trying to get to with this, but if you're, you know, tr trying to get the, the fibers back into the recycling system, I think the actual fibers that are coming off, that's going to be difficult uh, because they are so varied and different. They've got different chemical uh, cocktails on them, etc. I think it would be lovely. Um, I think it's going to be really difficult. And I think if we are going to look at it, it probably needs to come from something like wastewater sludge, uh, where there's a lot of accumulation of it all in one place. And how um, about garments? How about before it, they actually fall apart? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shay's our hope for the the former your former comment. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get Shay. You get the last last one on this. John, what do you think on <laughs> textile recycling and reverse supply chain type stuff? Yeah, hey, yes. Just as a believer in the the whole drive towards circularity and the the importance of that, uh, hundred percent. Yes, that it's got to be uh, something that is part of the solution. Shay, <laughs> shockingly, yes. Um, yeah, it's important. It's an important uh, piece of the puzzle to advance the larger transition to a circular economy. Uh, the technology being one piece of that. There are multiple pieces to make this larger vision work. So yes. Agreed. And yet yeah, Charles here just wrote a comment just about the materials themselves. And I agree, having billions of different materials does not serving our world well in terms of resource management, recovering value and anything like that. So part of this as a solution would have to zero in on the ability for us to recycle these things. So we have two minutes left. So that is kind of what I expected to have happen. I wonder if the last thing that we do is to say, is there an action? Let's leave people with an action that they could take to right now, knowing what we know, start to be in on the solutions to, to this problem. So let's see, John, what would you like people to do right now after they leave this session? Uh, look, uh, really simply, uh, wear more, wash less. Wear more, wash less. I love it. Shay? Uh, just just learn more. Just read more. Talk about it with people. If it's fun, do more of it. If it's not, don't. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's good. That's going to, that's going to, that resonates. Yeah. <laughs> Sophie? Um, and sorry for the commercial plug here, but sign up and join us at our launch on September the 21st. <laughs> exactly. And there's a lot of people here for whom that is relevant, I know. And for me, it's about uh, just conscious buying is do you need the thing you're about to purchase, especially as it relates to textiles? We know the back end of their life is fraught. The Perhaps the actual active life of current garments is somewhat fraught, but we do need them. So thank you, everyone. I'm sorry that we didn't get to uh, answer a lot of or very many of the attendee questions, but thank you for spending this last hour with us. Thank you to the team at Sea Change for keeping us pretty much rolling, you guys for following up when I froze, and for being here from the UK, New Zealand, and the West Coast. Uh, we appreciate your time, your expertise. I hope everyone who has attended will look us up and keep engaging. There are opportunities to do that. So thank you all. Keep up your amazing work. I have the highest respect for what you all are doing.